Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, this is Thomas Hubert, digital editor with the Irish Farmers Journal. The past week has seen catastrophic flooding around the country, and the River Shannon has been especially devastating to its neighbours. Last week, my colleague Odile Evans met one of them, dairy farmer John Claffey from Shannon Bridge, and she asked him what happened. Well, we're dealing with water that's heading on 2009 levels already and probably going to rise further. Farmyards flooded, hay destroyed, silage destroyed, um, an environmental disaster as well. Tanks, slurry tanks filling with water, uh, yards impassable, roads impassable and houses under threat. And like it's raining here again at the moment. Um, this is obviously going to filter through into the water system, into the Shannon. You know, when are we going to see this? It's, it's obviously going to get worse. When are we expecting to see it, it, its peak? I think from the ESP projections they had on Loch Ree, uh, we're going to go surpass 2009 levels by uh, possibly 6 or 9 inches, which is going to cover maybe another 20%, 30% ground that's covered already, because once it gets to that level, it goes into a lot more areas. Um, Loch Derg is at a level now where they have to spill more and more water over Parteen Weir. I think they've gone up to over 400 tonnes per second at the moment and 400 tonnes gone through the turbines. Um, Limerick is going to get flooded because there's so much water to come downstream. But Loch Ree is going to keep rising and the ESB projection on Loch Ree was, it for, was for it to go past 2009 levels. And you visited uh, Ardna Crusha, am I right, a That's few right. days ago. What, yeah. what did you find there? Well, we found that they are working on a fairly tight tolerance because of the canal banks that feed Ardna Crusha. If the water goes above a certain level, they're in danger of bursting out. If the water goes below a certain level, they're in danger of collapsing in. Um, they, what they told us that down there was that the water isn't coming down to them fast enough that they know the water is held up in the middle section and in Loch Ree, but it's not coming down fast enough. Um, we have pressed them hard on why they hadn't let more water go in advance of this, and they said the water wasn't there to be let go, even though we had it already. So it's the middle section of the Shannon that's causing the problem between Loch Ree and Loch Derg. The rainfall has been extreme all over the country, but yet other rivers, they're receding, their, their levels are stabilising. Why is the Shannon a problem? Well, the Shannon is a problem because it drains 20% of the country. So while other rivers have peaked and are flowing down, that water is only hitting us now. Most of that has to come through us. Um, Because the lakes and the river levels are being kept at too high a level, the buffer isn't there to absorb at least some of the water. Because the flow is so impeded, we can't move the water down fast enough. And until there's dredging and clearing done to get that water moving faster to be able to create the flow and the best example I can think of is for anyone who's been in traffic and traffic lights you want to see the light going green furthest away and then coming in sequence towards you so the traffic is moving there is absolutely no point in the light going green in front of you and nothing further on moving you don't get to move the While there is very good information in the last five or six years from the OPW with their GPS gauges and they're able to really monitor levels, there is no coordination or control on the flow of the water. And even if they had them in place at the moment to let the water come in sequence, the flow is so restricted it would make no difference. We were basically looking at nothing has been spent on the river since the foundation of the state Huge amounts of the country have been drained into it with arterial drainage pro- uh, projects, even individual farms. There's been a huge increase in road area, roof area, areas under tarmac and concrete. All that water is getting into our water system faster, but the main channel hasn't been cleared. So the main thing that needs to be done is uh, dredging of the river? Dr- dredging, and dredging in places, straightening in others, removing the islands that were not there. I'm talking islands that cover acres and there are dozens of them, they weren't there 30 or 40 years ago. It is not about protecting a habitat. That habitat shouldn't be there. It wasn't there 30 or 40 years ago. The river, the average depth in the river of the main channel has been reduced in half or more in some places. A farmer was telling me that when he goes out fishing on the Shannon, that the, the, the propeller on the boat is like an agitator in a slurry tank. The surface, the depth of the water is so shallow. We're talking three, four feet. Um... It used to be 20 to 25 feet, and there used to be salmon hatching grounds, and salmon would go back up the Shannon. Now the only fish that are in the Shannon in the middle section are pike, perch, and brame. Fishes that like dirty, cloudy water, that's their habitat. All the, f- the freshwater fish that were in the Shannon, we ha- their habitat was destroyed 30, 40 years ago. And most of that damage has come from Bordnamona. 
all the bogs that drain into the Shannon and the sur- from the surrounding areas, they were sponges that absorbed the water. Now they're not there anymore. All that, the bogs are designed to remove water as fast as possible. That water, and we're talking tens of thousands of hectares, is coming into the river much, much faster. So that buffer ground that was the, that the bogs were there for, that's gone. We have put so much more water in faster and faster without doing anything with the river. And for years, when there was more activity on the Shannon, every time the flood would go out in the winter or in the spring, we would have piles of milled peat on our land. The callows and the ecosystem there, the grasses that were there supporting butterflies, dragonflies, a huge amount of insects, all got destroyed. So the river has to be restored to what it was. The meadowlands and callowlands, if we can restore them to what they were, have to be restored to what they were. They are not growing the same species of grasses that they were. They are not supporting the same flora and fauna that were there. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Now that the Paris Climate Summit is over, attention is turning to solutions in tackling climate change at home. Ireland is placing a lot of hope in expanding its forests. And I sat down with our forestry specialist, Donald Magner, to take a good look at the sector and the way it can develop alongside traditional farming. I think this year... A couple of things have taken place uh, during the year, which actually I think has encouraged investment in forestry. I think we have a new forestry program, which extends until 2020. And that is now open to all investors in forestry, whether they be farmers um, or private investors. They get the same uh, establishment grants, which can be up to uh, 5,000 uh, euros per hectare. And then they get premium payments for 15 years which is around maybe 300 to 500 euros per hectare annual payments, which up to now um, uh, would have been taxed over a certain amount, just as income from forestry would have been taxed over 80,000 euros per annum. Uh, In the recent budget, this has been changed. So forestry once again is returned to its tax-free status that it was up to a few years ago. So that has boosted uh, confidence in the sector I think on the negative side, our planting programs are still just under 7,000 hectares per annum, even though the, um, the advisory research advisory group to the department itself maintains that we should be up around 15,000 hectares per annum to actually make a serious Im- impact in the industry sector and indeed in climate change as well. So climate change, of course, is the big thing that's coming down the road. Um, How do you see forestry contributing to Ireland's um, obligations in this area? I think um, the Taoiseach outlined last year that forestry now has a major role to play simply because of its um, ability to sequester carbon dioxide. And um, this is accepted now by government. And also, I think people who are involved in forestry see a tremendous opportunity to work with mainstream agriculture, which is, as you know, an emitter of greenhouse gases. So there's a huge opportunity for Ireland there, unlike other European countries. For example, in uh, some European countries, forest cover may be up to 60 or 70 percent of total land area. I think it's around 37 percent right across the European Union. We've only about 11 percent forest cover. So there is potential there to increase that from 11 to uh, 17, 18 percent which will be accepted by the EU as as it's not only for its uh, contribution to rural development and to the economy, but also for its climate change mitigation. If uh, I'm a regular farmer somewhere in Ireland, I have maybe some marginal land, or I, I'm not making much money with what I'm doing at the moment, would you say uh, looking at forestry is a good option? What should I have in mind if I look at this option and what are the risks? What should I be careful about? Yeah, I think uh, in, uh, our philosophy in the journal is is that uh, farmers should explore forestry where it's a good land use option. Uh, forestry should never compete with agriculture, but it should be complementary to agriculture. And I think that's happening now. But I think there should be no pressure on farmers to plant. I think farmers that have a percentage of their land, which may not be productive from from agriculture, should look at the forestry option. I did a series recently on comparing forestry with suckler suckler cows, uh, with um, with other forms of production, such as sheep. Mm -hmm. And it came out well ahead of sheep um, and ahead of sucklers in many instances. So it is a huge option there. Uh, Farmers, what they should look 
look at is, first of all, I think they should join one of their local producer groups, which are really farmers who have made the decision to plant. Because you can get all the advice you like from consultants and various people, but it's the people, your neighbours, who have made the decision that can provide you really with the best um, advice. I think um, farmers should look at uh, at this, which they which they do anyway, as as uh, as an economic decision for their farm, a financial decision, and in that regard, we do produce some of the fastest growing conifers in Europe, and are they are in huge demand by our sawmilling sector here, which has. Uh, been absolutely excellent over the last few years. They're now exporting, most of them are exporting mills. So there is a huge market for conifers. But I think uh, farmers should also think about the landscape because forestry does enhance the landscape. And I think a mix of conifers, native woodlands, restoring native woodlands is also an option. There are higher grants, higher premia available for those people who are actually going to, let's say, broadleaf species. So I think keep one eye on the landscape, but naturally enough, you've got to sell your product at the end. And the proven markets at the moment are for spruce and to a lesser extent, pine and Douglas fir. What about this market, uh, by the way? Um, what is Ireland um, needing in terms of timber? Where is it getting from at the moment? And what could the, the domestic industry do to uh, to grow and supply its domestic market? Yeah. Ireland is now virtually self, is self-sufficient in conifers, such as spruce for the construction industry. Uh, and it is a net exporter of those products. Uh, it still imports uh, hardwoods, which are in demand, uh, such as American hardwoods, beech, oak, and to a lesser extent these days, hardwoods from the tropics, which is a good thing. I think most countries now are looking at the sustainability of of the product as much as anything else. And there is an illegal logging directive in Europe, which puts the onus back on traders here to make sure that they only import from timber timber that has been sourced from uh, sustainably managed forests and ideally should have certification uh, with it. So we are we need to look at the market here. We can supply our own market here with, with uh, softwoods and we can export some. But we, I think we also need to have a more commercial orientated look at hardwoods as well. Uh, because at the moment, there's a tendency to look at hardwoods as more or less an aesthetic stroke biodiversity um, road. But hardwoods at the end, whether they, that be oak or beech or whatever, these are t- timbers that are used for furniture and for construction as well. Good business uh, there as well, yes. Donald, thank you very much. Uh, Your coverage is in the Farmer's Journal every week and online at farmersjournal.ie. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmer's Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Our Northern Ireland correspondent Peter McCann was at the Winter Fair organised by the Royal Ulster Society last Thursday. There, he met Gabriel Darcy, the chief executive of Lack Patrick, the dairy co-op formed this year when Bellier Shane merged with Town of Monaghan. It's been a, a great day here at the Winter Fair. Uh, I was here last year for the first time ever. Uh, it's a unique occasion. I don't see it happening in any other part of Ireland. Um, to, to meet and you get a chance to meet all of your suppliers all in one day. Uh, yeah, what I was talking about this morning was really probably to do with what I was listening to all afternoon was about milk price and uh, sustainability and profitability and try, trying to drive a strong profitable enterprise in this part of the country. Uh, like Patrick was formed out of the merger of Valley Rochane and Town of Monaghan to do precisely that. Um, not uh, not necessarily from exactly the same geography, Valley Rochane based outside of Coleraine, and Monaghan obviously based down south, south of the border, but significant overlap in terms of their supplier base and the geographies of those suppliers. And two outstanding chairmen, I have to say. Hugo Maguire and uh, Roy Irwin, I think, need and deserve a lot of credit for their approach to this. They recognize that even though and notwithstanding that these are two of the oldest co-ops on the land, that actually we're in a new era and a new paradigm. And the globalization of food, the globalization of the dairy industry 
has to be recognized in terms of the scale and the breadth and the depth of the participating companies. And it was it was those two outstanding chairmen with Nigel and myself and with the respective boards and indeed the whole supplier base of both co-ops, well over a thousand suppliers that actually uh, put their heads together and said, yeah, this is the right thing to do. This will enable us to become more competitive, increasing our efficiencies, uh, reducing costs in terms of milk collection and so forth. But it will also <coughs> enable us to be more innovative. And this underpins the significant investment that we're making in Arctic Arvin to produce a range of leading edge dairy ingredients that are going to be targeted at specific markets in West Africa and in Southeast Asia. Here, a lot of investment in Arctic Arvin, uh, 30 million sterling. You said a thing this morning that whenever it was announced, it was uh, in the media, you were actually surprised that it was described by some as you know, the biggest investment in uh, dairy in Northern Ireland in a generation. Yeah. And you were perhaps somewhat critical of that, that uh, although milk production in Norfolk has increased with so much investment in plants like that haven't. Um, and comparing that to, 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 to the South, what are your views or what, what do the rest of the industry in the North have to do to, to push on? Yeah, I, I'm glad you picked up on that, Peter. Like, I, I was taken aback. It's not, look, at, this was an observation that a, a commentator made to me uh, after we made this announcement. Uh, do you realize? And I, quite frankly, I didn't. Uh, then I did some uh, study uh, on it, and sure enough, it actually is. And then you kind of broaden the investigation. You say, well, what is going on uh, and what has happened? Uh, in the respective market, in, in the Northern Irish dairy market vis-a-vis the Republic of Ireland. Well, Northern Ireland warden inhibited by, uh, by dairy quotas. There was a great leader that I referred to this morning, Bill uh, Hodges, that actually spearheaded and drove, following the demise of the Milk Marketing Board, the development of the producer uh, network and the doubling the output of Northern Irish dairy from a billion to two billion litres at a time when the total production in the Republic was capped at five billion litres. So Northern Ireland is a very significant producer of the key raw material, milk, on the island of Ireland, much more than people actually understand or give credit for. Now, you say, well, what has happened at the market end of it? Well, you can see in the Republic of Ireland, probably with the uh, ending of quotas, that uh, the minister, and it was the former minister, not the present one, developed a a vision uh, that was uh, reflected in the Food Harvest Report, a vision to 2020 that has now been updated and been brought forward to 2025. This is involving the whole of the uh, stakeholders in the dairy sector in the Republic. The milk processors, uh, all the CEOs are engaged in this dairy forum, the um, Chagas, the Farm Advisory Service, um, the the various on board BIA, the Irish Food Board, um, Enterprise Ireland, very interestingly, the head of Enterprise Ireland attends these meetings. And this dairy forum now is all about implementing, implementing the, the, the food harvest plan. And there's no room or there's no place to hide. And what has happened in the last five or six years is that in the Republic, about 1.1, 1.2 billion, if you include infant formula, has been invested in this sector. And if you stand back and look at it on an all-island point of view and look at the amount of milk and where it arises and so forth, well, actually, I would argue that logically about 300 or 400 million of that investment should have been made in Northern Ireland in the northern, either by foreign direct investment or by indigenous investment. This didn't happen because, you know, for whatever reasons, everybody will have their reasons, but this is what should have happened. And we have to stop this uh, parochial approach. Uh, We have to recognize that we are an island and recognize that the dairy farmer in Coleraine produces as good, if not better, Irish butter as the dairy farmer in Mallow. And we need to market it under that brand where there is and it commands a premium Irish dairy commands a premium recognised and reputed globally and we need to understand that Northern Ireland has a part to play here Gabriel Darcy thanks very much for your time 
The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Last May, our editor Justin McCarthy heard third-year student and beef farmer Sarah Armstrong interviewed on RT Countrywide. She was so enthusiastic and knowledgeable about limousine cattle that the Irish Farmers' Journal decided to offer her a bursary to visit Sommet de l'Elvage, the main livestock show in the breed's French heartland. After her trip, Justin caught up with Sarah on her farm near Kilachandra in County Cavan. I just started my own pedigree limousine herd and they um, come from France. So um, I was thinking of maybe going to France sometime in the future and see the limousines out there and see how they work and how they like breed uh, the limousines that are like, so good. So I thought maybe if I went out I could like learn something about them and maybe bring something back to my farm. I heard you, Sarah, on the radio. I actually dropped Damien a text and I said, when that girl comes off the radio, uh, tell her we'd be more than delighted to help her go to France. So delighted uh, Sarah got uh, to go out to Sonnet Lavage. The phone just started ringing and I answered it and it was Justin and he was saying that he wanted me to go to France. Like I was really excited and I didn't really know how to react because I was just on the farm and I was actually checking the cows and I'd come in and I had to get passports and get all the travel things sorted out. We went with a group of farmers from all over Ireland and there was also a group from Chalkus and the Farmers' Journal who were in our um, group. And On the plane we got talking to a pedigree limousine breeder. He was sitting beside us and I learned a lot from him because he, he regularly goes out to France and he buys a lot of cattle in France and he was telling me about the testing stations and like the cows with um, a lot of breeding that went through um, testing stations that they were the cows kind of wanted to go after. Uh, we're going to the Wayland shed where we have all this year's Waynelands and two of my heifers. That's my purebred heifer, Ochnacreevy Halley. She's in calf to HCA. She's due a bull calf at the very start of January. The breeding programme in France is very different. We're here in your shed and there's lots of black whitehead cows, limousine cows. Whereas if you would, went to a farm in France, and I assume that the farm you were on is all pedigree breeding, so the suckler herd is actually a pedigree herd, there's very little crossbreeding. What do you think of that? Well, I like the pedigree route, but it can be expensive at times. And the suckler route, I prefer the suckler route because you get a load of different breeds and they give you different qualities and you can get easy calving from the Angus and you get muscle from the Charlix. I understand, Sarah, maybe there wasn't as many livestock there as you had hoped because of the blue tongue, which is disappointing. But Yeah, well, there was blue tongue out there the time we went out and there still is. It's a big issue in France, if anything. Actually, Irish farmers have benefited from it because it did stall the live export trade for Wienlands from France into Italy and we, we would have benefited from that specifically in October. Vaccination is now taking place, so it's probably less of, of an issue and the live export trade has probably cooled accordingly in Ireland because of it. But one thing I, I'm very interested in, Sarah, and it's a question that always gets me into a lot of trouble when farmers ask me, well, what's the ideal suckler cow? So maybe, Sarah, if you want to put your neck in the block and tell us from France what you learned and what Irish farmers need to be doing. Uh, well, I personally think the best suckler cow is limousine because it has like, a cross between milk and muscle. And they are like easy calf and, and a lot of people would say that limousines have like bad tempers, but I wouldn't agree with that. I think that they are quiet cattle and they have improved over the years through um, breeding. A great ambassador for the limousine breed as well, Sarah. I could never be as uh, straightforward as that. I have to play the political line a little bit more. But I think what you're saying is right in terms of milk and muscle. And I think that's something that's very important in whatever breed is that the cow has milk that will get you that weight at weaning as well. As a, as a good, well-conformed calf. Uh, obviously, I will say that all breeds have those traits within them, but uh, as a limousine breeder, you'll be forgiven for your bias, I'm sure. How long has this farm been in, in the family, and when did your interest in farming first ignite? Uh, well, the farm's been in the family for over 100 years. My great-grandfather bought it, and he brought it up to what it is today over the years. Um, I started in farming when I was quite young. Like I used to go out with my grandfather, and I used to feed calves and bottle feed the calves. 
and um, like I used to just like um, handle silage to them and pet the cows and stuff and I really like liked cows when I was younger. Quite similar as to how I got into farming Sarah in terms of growing up it's a great place to grow up on a, on a farm you're certainly not bored in the summer holidays what about yourself when you come back from school what's the plan? Well that's the story I do what has to be done on the farm and then I'll go home and I'll do my study and I'll do my homework. You're back home from school around five o'clock, welly boots on, out into the yard. Uh, yeah, straight away I have to go down, feed the cows and feed my heifers and check the cows, make sure they're all right. And everything. So Sarah, what's the bigger plan? You're in third year at the minute. Surely it'll be something to do with farming when you leave school. Yeah, like I want to study animal genetics and I want to like work especially with cattle genetics because that's where my interests lie. I'd really like to stay at home because I like staying like where I live and I like the farm. Like I love the area and everything. Well, certainly the area you're in, there's plenty of interest in cattle breeding. Uh, you're in the heartland of it here and it's always good driving through Cavan to see the passion that farmers have for breeding. Would you see maybe into some of the AI companies? Oh, like I'd like to get in with some of them because um, I like to be a breeding advisor and help other farmers as well in selecting bulls for their cows. Um, these are all this year's winnings. A lot of them are Charlie Cross because we had a Charlie Bull and some of them's out of heifers. They're uh, the Angus and Whiteheads up here. And what's the plan then, Sarah, for, for these? What are they getting at the, their silage here in front of them? Are you giving them any meal? They're not getting meal at the minute, but uh, they will be in a couple of weeks. The bull calves, they'll be squeezed and they'll be fattened up to two-year-olds and be sold on for beef. And the heifers, will keep the four to five-star heifers as replacements and we'll sell the rest. What, you mentioned four or five-star heifers. What do you think of the new beef genomics programme? Well, I think it's a good scheme, but a lot of people don't agree with it because they think like they're one-star cattle, that they're good cattle, and I do agree with them. But um, we need milk in the cattle. So. I think that's very important. And is that something you're trying to breed into your two pedigree heifers, milk? Yeah, well, I want milk in them so they can rear a good calf for me so I can sell them on. This shed here, this is the actual house that my great-grandfather came to. It was uh, done up into a milking parlour, but we're not milking anymore. So it's just like a buyer at the minute. And then um, we kind of have the cattle sheds over in the corner and we have the calving pens over this other corner. So it's kind of like um, all kind of together, like we don't have to travel far to Anthem. We own all of this and that's a ring fort up there. And then there's just the house opposite and then the farm in front of it and then beside it the granddad's house. Just walking up through the road, Sarah, I notice you're using a lot of electric fencing. Do you paddock the fields during the summer or how do you manage your grass? Uh, well, they're paddocked. Uh, when the cows are done eating, we move the fence over and over and then they would be moved to another field when it's all gone. There's a pedigree cow in there. She's daddy's cow. Um, she had a heifer calf and there is another calf in there, a Charlie Cross calf out of a Belgian blue. He was a very muscled calf when he was born. He was a big, massive calf. We had to calve him by C-section. It was kind of unexpected. We didn't really expect it at all. And it was quite a surprise because we hadn't had C-section in years. It could have been like uh, seven years. And Sarah, I see as we walk up here, it's beal silage you make here. Very popular in County Calvin. You don't go for pit silage? Well, we used to be pit, but we quit that. Uh, the round bales is kind of easier to manage. We can move them if they're in the way and... We can put them in different places and it's way easier to manage. What type of year has it been in terms of weather conditions? We had a pretty good autumn, but obviously a lot of rain in the last few days. But overall, it probably hasn't been too bad a year. Well, it was a good year. We got the silage made, which was great. It's quite cold now at the minute. We had to put all the cows in and the calves because it's quite wet outside now. Justin, here we have the heifer I won in the Roscommon Fatstock raffle. She's a Belgian blue heifer off STQ out of a limousine cow. And how did you win this heifer? When I was at the ploughing, they were selling tickets for her, and I decided I'd buy a ticket, but I didn't really expect to win her. I had a lot of offers to buy her off me, but I wouldn't sell her. You wouldn't take a good price for her, Sarah, no? No, I wouldn't take Anton for her. She's mine and I'd like her. And I really want to keep her because she's a good heifer. And no doubt she'll be lucky for you. Well, hopefully she will be. Like I hope to get a good calf off her.
I hope to show her next um, summer and put her in calf to um, maybe Ardlia Dan. And there's a bull in Powerful Genetics. I might use Anna. Why are you selecting that bull? Uh, well, he's a uh, known like breeder of good calves and wanes, and a lot of the calves would win prizes. Like they're good, um, well muscled calves. Nice, Sarah. I can't let you away without questioning you on, on, on that heifer. You wouldn't want to go to your bed at night. Uh, if that heifer was calving and let her at it herself, she's a very muscly heifer to be putting in calf. Uh, well, she was. T- she is a breeding heifer. That's what I, um, I was told, and uh, she will be shown in the breeding heifer classes. But I will have to keep a good eye on her. Sarah, I notice as we're walking around the farm, you have lots of signs up warning people of caution, and I see your board be a quality assurance sign. Something that's in the limelight a lot is farm safety. Well, it's like very important, especially children, because there has been a lot of children involved in farm accidents. And I think all of it could have been prevented with the proper measures put in place. You're very active on Twitter and Instagram and, uh, and whatnot. How do you find that uh, as a way of communicating? Well, like, you learn a lot and you get to know new people and like, you learn lots of new things about farming and how they do things and what bulls they use and their opinions. My username is at FarmingMadIRE. It would kind of explain me, to be honest, because <laughs> um, I am farming mad. And thanks to Louis Denvir of RTE for recording this interview. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast online at farmersjournal.ie, on the Irish Farmers Journal app, and on iTunes every Thursday. Brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy.